On November 22nd of 2023, the community of Sexaholics Anonymous lost one of our great old timers, David M. David died as he lived, a sober member of Sexaholics Anonymous. His sobriety date was August of 1988. This talk is the last live talk that David gave. David, you will be forever missed and forever remembered for your experience, strength, and hope. Serenity prayer. God, grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change courage to change the things we can, and wisdom to know the difference. Thy will, not ours, be done. Are we okay? He was clasping his earphones to his head. My name is David. I am a sexaholic. And by the grace of uh, my higher power, my sobriety date's August 2nd, 1988, for which I can never... I... Uh, that credit goes to my higher power, that's for sure, uh, for which I can never be sufficiently grateful. And there was a woman here in Nashville who uh, used that phrase, for which I can never be sufficiently grateful. And, um, and I just had an email from her yesterday, so I'm very excited about that, to have that memory. And um, so I was sitting at dinner and was figuring it's been... 31 years, five months, and eight days. Um, and uh, every one of those in their own way has been a miracle. And that's a little bit of what I'd like to uh, share tonight. And uh, I was told uh, after my first year of sobriety that it keeps getting better. And that has been uh, the simple description of my experience in Sexaholics Anonymous, that it keeps getting better. And in fact, uh, the last meeting uh, on Sunday, that's the title of the meeting. It keeps getting better. As a framework uh, for my talk, I, I was trying to th give some thought. Um, there was an uh, event going on here in Nashville about uh, 15, well, more than that, what am I saying, 27 years ago, uh, in which a very famous person in the civil rights movement was being honored. It was a big deal. There were probably three or four hundred, maybe more people in the room, and, and um, there was a lot of hoopla going on and talks. And, and finally, they um, said, well, let's, his name was, first name was Miles, and Miles, uh, uh, we are so pleased to have you. We're so pleased to give you this uh, annual award, and um, would you please uh, stand up and, and share some thoughts with us? And Miles stood up at the table and stood right, he stayed right at his round table, in that room, and he said, my life is my story. And he sat down. I am not going to do that. <clears throat> I will say it's tempting. So I thought what I'd like to use is a rough framework and walk my way through, and I'll share some of my story as we go through it. Um, what is a sexaholic, and what is sexual sobriety? My first meeting, which was at West End United Methodist Church here in Nashville, we of course used those readings. They were in a different format then, both in physical format and the words were different, somewhat different. But what is a sexaholic and what is sexual sobriety basically hasn't changed since then. And it begins, we can only speak for ourselves. And as Eric just shared a few minutes ago, and other speakers have already shared and will share, as one person uh, quaintly describes it, if Alcoholics Anonymous is, for those, is the last house on the block for those who need it, Sexaholics Anonymous is the outhouse behind the last house on the block. <laughs> And 
And when Eric was talking about fear, one of my moments of shame in this program, by the way, is my sponsor said, David, it says, driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-seeking, self-delusion, and self-pity, come up with a hundred forms of fear. And I only came up with 72. I'm still carrying that burden to this day. We can only speak for ourselves. So much of what we respond to in ourselves and in one another, in our meetings, in our literature, in the gatherings like this, is beyond the understanding of so much of our society. It's, it keeps changing, I'm well aware. Nonetheless, um, it is still um, often very, very lonely uh, in society, and it's so important to be together. And we indeed are the only ones who can speak for ourselves. One of the things, though, that gives us power to go through on a daily basis, what we do, is what was handed to us from Alcoholics Anonymous. Because when that started in 1935, it was pretty much the same situation. Alcoholics were just a lost cause. There was no hope they were going to get better. They could just be institutionalized or marginalized or otherwise tolerated and kept sort of contained, but there was no hope. And then suddenly, <clears throat> beginning on June 10th, 1935, there was hope. And that's the date, <clears throat> by the way, of Dr. Bob's last drink, or his first day of sobriety, I guess. And, um, and it's very similar for us. In the uh, white book, Roy talks about the issue of, the issue of Time magazine that was uh, published in 1974. And um, I have said before, I've been looking for it. I know it's in my files. I just can't find it. But I had saved that cover and that story. And I still have it somewhere. Um, but that was 14 years before I came into Sexaholics Anonymous. And that was five years before SA came into existence. So we've always been needed, and there have been people around us, as the magazine article was written about, that knew that some help was possibly available through 12-step recovery. Nonetheless, we can only speak for ourselves. The specialized nature of Sexaholics Anonymous can best be understood in terms of what we call the sexaholic. When I came into Sex Alex Anonymous here in Nashville, we had six meetings a week. We did not have a Sunday night meeting at that time, so I went to another fellowship that was here. Those six meetings, certainly on a per capita basis and possibly on any basis, I'm just not sure about the second part, uh, were the most meetings in the world, in the entire globe. Six meetings, every night but Sunday. And then we did finally have our Sunday night meeting. And one of my most spectacular memories of Nashville was my wife and I, we had Essanon meeting there too, my wife and I driving back in from the Sunday night meeting on the freeway coming in. And um, Cherry, who was Harvey's sponsor before he died, Harvey. Uh, talked about how sad he was that Cherry was close to death and did in fact die. And Cherry looked at Harvey and said, Harvey, third step, let it go. And so we did that here in Nashville, and we do it all over, of course, let it go. And of course there's this, which is emergency letting go. <laughs> so my wife and I were behind a car on the freeway, and suddenly out of the right-hand window came this, and out of the left-hand window, the driver's window, came this. <laughs> and we laughed all the way back into Nashville. <laughs> and yet here was a man, I'm passing that story on to you tonight. Here was someone who has now died 32 years ago, nearly, just shy of 32 years, whose message is being carried on. And that's the message we carry on every time we have a meeting every time we pick up our answer the phone, every time we read the literature, every time we hold hands, whatever it is. And the merciful thing for me is how close our fellowship is, in my experience anyway, to Alcoholics Anonymous, which means that if I have 
we have 37 meetings a week in Nash in the Portland area, so in Oregon, Southwest Washington. So that's a lot of meetings, and it's a lot more than six. Um, but in fact, if something doesn't work out, I have 800 more meetings I can choose from per week to go to. And the biggest problem I have, if you've been to AA, you know this, the biggest problem I have in going to AA meetings as a sexaholic is not saying, my name is David, I'm a sexaholic during the AA meeting. So. <laughs> Otherwise, it's the same, virtually the same readings or very similar readings, uh, the opening to chapter five, all of that. So the sexaholic name ties us into this immense reservoir of spiritual success and hope for the recovering alcoholic, sexaholic. And we are very specialized. I've always wanted to feel I qualified for the special ed bus, and I finally do. <laughs> we are very specialized. And I tell people I sponsor, I said, you know, I know you because I'm mentally ill and you're mentally ill. That's what we have in common. Did I ask for this mental illness? No. Did I sign up for it? No. Do I have it? Yes. And I've always preferred the analogy to alcohol, I mean to a diabetes, excuse me, in that nobody signs up to be a diabetic. Nobody wants their pancreas to shut down and for them to be insulin resistant and all the things that go with that. We can do things that make it more likely. I'm well aware of that. Nonetheless, it just happens. And once it happens, you know what? My best friend from college has been injecting insulin for 53 years. It just happens. And either we accept it and live our lives accordingly, or we don't. And that's the nature of our disease, the specialized nature of Sexaholics Anonymous. The sexaholic has taken him or herself out of the whole context of what's right or wrong. Even reading that sentence, I'm getting goosebumps standing here. Because I can remember how lonely I was. I can remember how lonely I was as a six-year-old. I shared earlier to this afternoon that when I came to my first meeting that I mentioned a while ago, and at the end they were saying we made the real connection, we were home, that I started crying because I was 42 at that point and I had been looking for a home for a long, long time. I just didn't fit in. And like any good addict, my disease was chronic, progressive, and one meeting, I was, Jimmy was sitting next to me, and he was um, talking about, he was a traveling salesman, and at that time it was before computers, so he was hand filling forms, and he had to have the forms be perfect. And, um, he would go through like 20 forms to get one perfect form just to place a, oh, it was clothing, to place an order for clothing. And I was sitting next to him puffing up thinking, oh, well, I'm not that kind of perfectionist. And then I realized, no, David, you're not a perfectionist about any one thing. You think you can do everything perfectly. <laughs> and that's what was going on on the inside. I was going to have this perfect world. I was a very benevolent king, in case anybody cares. Uh, a very benevolent king who thought sex was really important, and what Eric described about his drawings in elementary school, same thing here. And, um, well, not the murder, maybe. I, I didn't like blood. Um, and um, anyway, it's just that isolation, uh, being, taking him or herself out of the whole context of what is right or wrong. And I didn't know it was a question of right or wrong. I thought it was just what I had to have. And like Roy's story in the white book where he talks about keeping, learning how to keep a secret when he wanted to, I think it was sucking his thumb, right, if I remember. Um, I, uh, I just had all these secrets to keep. My secrets began when I was four years old. Uh, my disease, I can track my disease from age four on. Um, I was taking off my clothes in public and I was compulsively fantasizing. Um, about mostly fairy tale kinds of things. I just couldn't stop though. It just r took over my whole life. And, and then uh, I was punished for, or chastised, I suppose more accurately, for voyeurism uh, of girls on the playground standing under the slide uh, when I was five. Um, 
I was uh, sort of caught, apprehended, nude with other boys, uh, sexually uh, attempting to act out. We didn't know what the heck we were doing. When I was seven, um, when I was 10, I discovered masturbation. Uh, my first fantasy masturbation partner was my mother, and I thought that wasn't right, so I switched it to an older woman next door. Um, but, uh, but what didn't change was the fantasizing and, and the compulsive masturbation, which once I started never didn't stop till I came in this fellowship. I did think there was a problem though, because at 13, I remember in a sex education class, asking in one of these ask it boxes, ask it box questions, uh, how much masturbation is too much? And, and the teacher's answer was, when he got to that question, was, um, well, if you're hurting yourself, it's probably too much. And um, I did, in fact, of course, hurt myself over the years doing things, and yet it never seemed like it. Just, I just, so he sort of gave me a buy on that. But at 13, I knew something was really wrong. Um, sex with animals, cross-dressing, um, use of pornography in all its forms, constant fantasizing, um, uh, voyeurism, uh, sadomasochistic acting out, multiple adulterous affairs, and uh, I always leave something out of my disease. I was pretty thorough. Uh, <laughs> I was also cheap. Uh, after my first meeting, this was really ironic to me, after my first meeting I stopped by my office where I had a collection of pornography behind my desk and I grabbed it all. I later found one I had overlooked. It was in another part of the room, but, but I grabbed all my pornography and took it outside and threw it out. And, uh, and underneath me was a meeting going on in another room in the building that was a, a very aggressive women's group uh, meeting. And I thought that was really ironic. Uh, and I was really glad to get rid of this stuff. Uh, and then uh, at that time, we had about 40% of our people who came to meetings were women. The first, my first meeting was all men, as it happened, but we had a lot of women early on here in Nashville. And, um, and one woman talked about her using clothes. And I've never forgotten it. Um, and I remember the impact it had on me, and I immediately knew exactly what my using clothes were. And this was fairly early on in sobriety. And so I went home and threw out my using clothes. Um, and uh, it really doesn't matter what they are, it mat what matters is what impact did they have on me. And if I was going to be honest about that and get them out of my life, that's what I needed to do. Himself or herself, out of the whole context. I remember sitting behind Jean Pease uh, in a meeting and she had the large uh, eight and a half by 11 version of the white book that existed at that time and lines were scratched out and other things were written in. And one of the things that was written in right in front of me was herself. And that's when what is a sexaholic and what is sexual sobriety, it, it was first introduced here in Nashville in 1990, um, uh, became in terms of pronouns open to uh, women. It was open to women anyway, as I said, but uh, in fact, with the pronouns were finally uh, catching up. Uh, with our, our writing, and it's, it's been great. It's been exactly what we needed. He or she has lost control, no longer has the power of choice, and is not free to stop. Lust has become an addiction. I had been on the periphery of Alcoholics Anonymous enough to know that for an alcoholic, alcohol is not the problem. If alcohol is a problem, just don't drink. Then you don't have any more problems. The problem with alcohol, for the alcoholic, is the ism. I, myself, and me. ISM. And you know the, the self-centeredness and the character defects, defects of character that feed this compulsive use of whatever, in our case, lust. And I had been, I'm not alcoholic yet anyway, and I, on the, I had been on the periphery enough to know that um, how powerful AA was and, and when I came into that first, this happened on the first meeting and then never stopped. Um, when people talked about getting drunk on lust, I, I knew exactly that identified on day one. I knew I got drunk on masturbation. O over time, I also learned about drunk, getting drunk on fantasies, getting drunk on whatever. Um, and um, I just had a memory come up, I'll share it in a second. And, um, 
and, and I really, that's exactly what it is. It, it was just a lust addiction. Um, and I definitely had lost control, no longer had the power of choice, and it's not free to stop. I was driving from Vanderbilt over toward Hillsborough Road, and I came up to a traffic light, and there was a car parked, in, I mean, uh, stopped in front of me for the red light. There was a woman in the car. I never saw anything other than she was sitting, so it was just her head above the seat, and I was totally triggered by her hair. This is my third or fourth day of sobriety. Totally took me by surprise. Because I had no idea until that moment how constantly I was lusting. And I've always described myself as the kind of sexaholic who never, like an alcoholic, who never lets the glass run dry. Some people are bingers. I understand that. I'm just not one of them. I just never let the lust bottle run dry. And, um, and really, that character defect hasn't gone anywhere. Just like all of my defects of character, they don't go anywhere. It's like my eye color. What has changed is they don't run my life anymore. And, and that's, that's a big change for which I'm never sufficiently grateful. Our situation is like that of the alcoholic who can no longer tolerate alcohol and must stop drinking altogether, but is hooked and cannot stop. I had people with whom I worked who begged me to stop going out to the lunches, having the special conversations, closing my office door to have, you know, uh, consultations about whatever. Um, and I had, uh, certainly my wives, um, in my second marriage, my wife and I had been married 43 years, so, and the first marriage was eight years, so we, we, we've been working on it. But we also totally restarted the marriage after 12 years, which is how long we've been married when I came in. And, um, and she certainly wanted me to stop. It was not, you know, this was not her idea of fun. And, uh, and I was, you know, I'm a nice guy. I'd been sober about two weeks. We were separated inside the house. And we would talk at night. I would sit at the top of the stairs, and she was living in downstairs. It was a finished basement area. Had a you know, level outside access and all that. And, um, and one night she said, you know, you're so different from my first husband. His name was Jack. And she ran down all the ways I was different from Jack. And then she said, and you have one thing that's the same. You're both sex addicts. And <laughs> two things happened. First of all, it was a reminder that it wasn't simply an accident that she and I were together. And secondly, that was the night she knew she needed Essanon and, and continued going. I mean, she was already starting, but because that wasn't on me in that case. Uh, and we found each other, and it's been great. It really has. It's been a great thing. And as I've said, I, did, I identified with getting drunk on lust. Uh, I wanted to stop. I couldn't. Uh, I remember uh, when I was about 21, I was in, it was back in the time when encounter groups were a big thing, or popular thing anyway, in some circles. And I was in a counter group, and I said to a, another woman who was, a woman who was in the group, well, I'm not sexually attracted to you. And I thought I had just said one of the most important things that the world could have ever heard. <laughs> she didn't seem to think it was important one way or the other. Um, what I didn't realize till much later, and really after coming in this program, is that I think she was the only one. <laughs> um, and there really were another hundred and some million people, women in this country, to say nothing of elsewhere. And, um, and I was remarkably egalitarian on lust. Uh, and so I was patting myself on the back for this one, and I'm not even sure it was true, it just got a good reaction. But I definitely identified with that line in what is a sexaholic, but is hooked and cannot stop. And I certainly, I mean, that was me. Thus, for the sexaholic, for the sexaholic, this is only a program for the sexaholic. We don't claim it's for anybody else. Any form of sex with oneself or with partners other than the spouse is progressively addictive and destructive. <laughs> And that's what I identified immediately because I knew, as I said, I got drunk on masturbation. I got drunk on fantasies. I got drunk on lust. And the only solution was to not do it. 
just let it go. And that it's okay. I tell guys almost weekly in some context or another, it's perfectly okay, occasionally I tell it to women too, to be sexually attracted to your spouse. There's nothing wrong with that. It's as normal as normal can be. Being sexually attracted to someone who's not your spouse in the crucible of our experiences is progressively addictive and destructive. That's all. We're not negative about it. We just say, it'll destroy us. <laughs> and in my case, it's definitely about two years before I came in in 1988, for some reason I made a list of women with whom I'd had affairs. I always assumed looking back on it that was probably notches on a bedpost kind of thing, I guess. And, um, and I remember being shocked, first of all, by the length of the list. It wasn't, it was, it's, this is not a competition, but nonetheless, it was significant, but not, not anything dramatic. And, well, one person in our fellowship said he had 3,000 sex partners, so I wasn't in that league. <laughs> but what really got me wasn't that. I knew everybody on the list in, you know, in some way or another. What got me was the frequency had picked up. It was happening more often, shorter periods of time between new affairs, and I had no idea until I wrote the list. That got me. Progressively addictive and destructive. We see that lust is the driving force behind our sexual acting out, and true sobriety includes progressive victory over lust. I'm a reasonably intelligent guy and reasonably okay with language and talking, and, and so I knew that, that being sexually active was, you know, people have been having troubles with their sexual activities since time immemorial for human beings. And I knew that I had tried everything. It turned out that was a gift. I didn't realize it. I had tried everything I knew to stop, and I couldn't do it. And, um, and to be told that it wasn't, as Jess, my sponsor Jess used to say, it wasn't the sexual acting out that was the problem, David. It was the lust in your head that's the problem. And not only did that ring true, it also gave me a context, because as I said, it started at age four. I, I, you know, occasionally I'll meet family, kids, you know, 10, 12 years old, and I look at them and I think, gee, by your age, I was on a tear for six years. I was on a tear for eight years. Now, is that true for everybody? No. Was it true for me? Yes. These conclusions were forced upon us in the crucible of our experiences in recovery. We have no other options. But we have found that acceptance of these facts is the key to a happy and joyous freedom we could otherwise never know. I didn't believe that crap for a long time. I was miserable. I didn't want to lose another marriage. I didn't want to lose another set of kids that had already done that once. I didn't want to lose my occupation or my job, my job or my occupation, because it probably would have been both. And uh, I was pretty terrified. And I was in a lot of pain. I really wanted to stop, but could not. And what brought me immediately into this program was my wife having a mental breakdown, a nervous breakdown in front of me. And, and that was appalling. I didn't want to be that guy who had that impact on a wife that he loved. And the next day we went to a counselor and she listened to me describe, well, I just need to be involved apparently with more than one woman at a time. And she said, well, you're a sex addict. And it was kind of like saying, well, you like saltines. <laughs> and I went to my first meeting that night. And as I said, I've been going ever since. I tried to go to 90 meetings in 90 days. I think I only made just under 80. Um, but I've tried to make up for it since then. Um, and it turns out that happy and joyous freedom, which is what the big book says, happy, joyous, and free, it turns out this entire program is about freedom. If I accept the fact that I'm a sexaholic, that I really need to have our sobriety definition, that what is offered to me is freedom. I didn't have freedom. I knew I didn't have freedom. And I was offered this freedom if I wanted it if I was willing to do the things that it took. 
This will and should discourage many inquirers who admit to sexual obsession or compulsion, but who simply want to control and enjoy it, much as the alcoholic would like to control and enjoy drinking. Harvey used to be able to recite the names and memories of all the people who came and then left. And one time I called him up and I said, Harvey, musicians can't get sober. And he said, David, most people can't get sober. <laughs> You just happen to be focusing on musicians today. <laughs> it was a guy I sponsored that I was talking about. And, um, and I've, ever since that time, so that was probably 27, 28 years ago, ever since that time, when I'm sitting in a meeting and there's a group of people, whether it's one other person or 10 other people or 50 other people, everyone there is a miracle because the vast majority of people do not want what we have and are not willing to go to any length to get it. We are walking, or sitting, usually, miracles. <laughs> this will and should discourage many inquirers who admit to sexual obsession or compulsion, but who simply want to control and enjoy it, much as the alcoholic would like to control and enjoy drinking, until we had been driven to the point of despair, until we really wanted to stop but could not. We did not give ourselves to this program of recovery. And that's what I try to reconnect with all the time. I want to remember that point of despair, which I had. I really wanted to stop, but could not. And I was willing to give myself to this program. Sexaholics Anonymous, and I remember this line. I use it frequently and th remember frequently. Sexaholics Anonymous is for those who know they have no other option but to stop. And their own enlightened self-interest must tell them this. So it begins with we can only speak for ourselves, and it ends with our own enlightened self-interest must tell us this, that I have no other option but to stop. And that's a commitment I have to, I don't have to, I choose to renew it every day. There's a guy, a sponsor, who happens to be here tonight, and he is simply appalled that when someone calls me up and says they had so much sobriety and they'd been really working a good program and they just acted out. And I listen to him and I say, you know, it's better you than me. <laughs> and he just thinks that's terrible. And I just think it's my enlightened self-interest that I'll try to stay around and keep coming back. And as the last line in the 12 and 12 says, this is a program, uh, humility, based on anonymity, is the best safeguard SA can ever have. And humility and anonymity. Anonymity in terms of secrecy of our identities, if someone needs it, and also anonymity in terms of coming in as equals. We're all equal in this program. We all come in with a common problem, and mercifully, we have a common solution. The seventh step prayer, my creator, I'm now willing you should have all of me, good and bad. I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of character that stands in the way of my usefulness. God, I hate that line. <laughs> He's going to leave some in there. My usefulness to you and my fellows, I don't really hate it. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. Amen. I have found over the years that gratitude, saying thank you God is the way I usually do it, is the best solvent for resentment. I do resentments as well as anybody. They don't work any better for me than they work for, don't work for you. And gratitude is the solvent that'll work the fastest. I've tried all sorts of other solvents and that one's, you know, step work and all that, it's all fine. Gratitude works the best. And then just last, uh, we'd go to a couple's greeting uh, twice a month, and last Saturday night, one of the guys there said, and besides, I've never met a miserable, grateful person. <laughs> and that, I just love that line. I don't want to be, a, I'm, I'm not capable, if I'm being grateful, of being a miserable, grateful person. I have found in making amends and doing the changes that I have to make to keep David sober another day, there are two constants, and they are so important to me, I wanted to share them tonight. Because they're the things that will keep me stirred up and feed the resentments, especially if the gratitude is missing. 
one of the constants is holding on to something that's no longer happening. In fact, I tell people, because it's true, that's the literal meaning of the word resentment. Re means again, sentir is to feel. A resentment is having a strong feeling about something, it might be negative, it might be positive, that isn't actually happening. Now, if something's not actually happening, we call it a fantasy. And you know what? Fantasies are not particularly helpful to me. And I don't think they're helpful to any of us. So when I'm engaging in a resentment, I'm engaging in that strong feeling about something that's not happening. It's a fantasy. And I, I have the tools to surrender it. I just need to use them. The other constant in my experience in terms of changing things, and I first encountered this when I went and did an amends at my father's grave, is expecting someone to be different than the way they actually are. Because that's what I do with fantasies, isn't it? I tr create this magic world in which David has people do the, it's like this said in the big, described in the big book, people do the things I want them to do in the way I want them to do them and all that stuff. And instead of ex accepting the way people actually are, which might be they're terrible. Sometimes I'm terrible, you know. Um, it might be wonderful. It might be just sort of average. It's the way they actually are. And it was in this very building 30 years ago that Robin M., in a different room, not this room, said, you know, expectations are premeditated resentments. That's a doorway to freedom, guys and women. If I can have expectations, if I want them, if I want to expect people to be different than the way they are, I'm, willing, I'm welcome to do that, and it's a premeditated resentment. And you know whose fault that is? Mine. It's not on anybody else. I have found over the years that for me, I, Harvey lied to me once. I've forgiven him long since. He said, David, if you start thinking about something, it'll be negative within two minutes. It has never taken anywhere more than one minute, at most. <laughs> and usually much less time. And, and what I finally realized what I was doing was obsessing. Obsessing is thinking about something more than once, unless there's been a change of fact or circumstance. And I've come up with, uh, I use my last name normally, but this is a recording, so I think I'll just say David's Law instead of my last name's Law. And, and, and the law is this, and, I've been, and the only reason it's a law is I've been trying to find an exception to it for 31 years, five months, and, and eight days. And that is, I only obsess about things I can do nothing about. <laughs> I have never, I have never obsessed about something I can actually do something about. This program has so many forms of humiliation, and that's how I learn, as we all do, I think. And one of them has been so important, I just wanted to share it tonight, and it happened here in Nashville. I, not long after I came in, I became totally, which I still am to this day, totally enamored of the uh, third step prayer. And I would really lean on myself. I did it so often, I would wake up doing it in the night, and I still do. And um, and I wanted my people I sponsored to do the third step prayer and memorize it and all that. And one night we were standing in a circle. It might have been at the Methodist church, but it doesn't really matter. It might have been another church. And we were doing the third step prayer. And oh, I, it was so wonderful. I, they were finally doing what I wanted them to do. And oh, I'm so important. And uh, so we were going along doing it and take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help. And then David, I mean the group said, of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life, which is how it's written. And David said, of thy love, thy power, and thy way of life. I had screwed it up. And I didn't even know it. And on top of that, I knew as soon as I said that and realized I had memorized it wrong, that I was definitely wanting to be sure of the love before I was going to go anywhere near that power. <laughs> well, first of all, the two things have come out of that experience, and that's what I wanted to share. First of all, it really is thy power, thy love, and thy way of life, and that is how it works. We accept some, several people have asked me, how do I get a better relationship with my higher power? Well, that's first is accept the power. As Harvey said early on, David, the only thing you have to know about your higher power is it's not you. 
and I start there literally every morning. And the second thing is I don't change the words in the prayers. I know a lot of the language is archaic. I know Roy rewrote it in the white book and all that. I just can't do it. Not because it's not right or wrong. It's because I can't stop. And I won't even know I've done it. So I share that with you. Um, there's some things I'm really pleased about that happened here in Nashville. And I just want to mention them briefly. One um, is that I was on the oversight committee and the committee decided to move the office, uh, central office here out of Southern California. We'd had the earthquake, Northfield, Northridge earthquake, and, and the office was damaged, and it was time to move. And Roy had turned the fellowship over to this little Cook Committee, Central Office Oversight Committee. And so we moved it here. That was great. I remember getting the space on Murfreesboro Road and sharing it with s and and, and of course, the rest is, is history. And Kay, uh, came in August of that year after we moved the office and, and uh, Roy and Iris stayed in my house while we were looking for the first administrator who it turned out had to not continue. That was a real treat. Another thing that was about 1994, 95, I was just learning about computers and email getting in bad trouble with some of that, but not in terms of lust addiction. And uh, just for a whim looked up to see if SA.org was available. And it was. I had no idea what to do with that, so I called Deke and I said, we gotta grab this name. So he grabbed it. And, and SA.org has been our website uh, name ever since. And by the way, I don't want you to go do this, but sexolics.com, you do not want to go to, and you are hearing it from me, don't go there. So, I, I didn't check it out, but I, I was told by others and it turned out to be true. The last thing that I'm really pleased about is that um, 20 years ago I was roughly uh, allowed to edit the essay for a number of years and then uh, I've been the editor for the last four some years now. Um, <laughs> this is the December issue, uh, Miracles in Recovery. And um, it's been, it's such a pleasure to work on it. And it's also a lot of work and it's worth doing. And new things keep coming along. So today in the lobby, uh, I was telling someone about this and he said, can I, get a, uh, can I get this sent to me? And I said, well, it's available free online. And we, of course, you can subscribe. He lives overseas, so that would be a, you know, expensive. But, and he said, no, can I just get it sent to me? Can I pay on the SA store for a subscription and just have it sent to me so I don't have to go to the website and look it up? And I never even thought of that thought. I'm sure many other people have. I, so we'll try to do that, see if we can do it in the next few months. I, I think it takes some engineering, but uh, it's not impossible. And, and so there's always things happening. And the model I hope for this is always the grapevine, uh, the AA publication, and to a certain extent, we imitate it, and to a certain extent, we have a way to go, but uh, it's one day at a time. Um, in uh, August, we celebrated 40 years of Sexolics Anonymous. I'm down to my last two minutes, I think, so that's what I'm watching. Uh, and, um, and copies of that 40-year issue, which has a lot of our historical stuff in it, uh, are available out in the literature table, and you might want to look it up. I think it'd be uh, a great thing to have. So. The last thing I wanted to share is um, I have uh, been dealing with a fairly significant cancer in my liver for just about since last May now. And, uh, and a few days ago, I have a guy that we're going through the 12 and 12, uh, one to two pages at a time, sometimes just a paragraph. And this was the reading just a few days ago. Well, at the top of the page, uh, we have seen AAs suffer lingering and fatal illness with little complaint and often in good cheer. And I keep saying, so much of dealing with cancer is like this program. It's very similar. But this is the paragraph at the bottom of the page, and, and with this I'll, uh, I'll go to my last theme and wind up. Like most people, we have found that we can take our big lumps as they come. But also, like others, we often discover a greater challenge in the lesser and more continuous problems of life. Our answer is in still more spiritual development. Only by this means can we improve our chances for really happy and useful living. And as we grow spiritually, we find that our old attitudes toward our instincts need to undergo drastic revisions. Our desires for emotional security and wealth, 
for personal prestige and power, for romance, and for family satisfactions, all of these have to be tempered and redirected. We have learned that the satisfaction of instincts cannot be the sole end and aim of our lives. If we place instincts first, we've got the cart before the horse. We shall be pulled backward into disillusionment. But when we are willing to place spiritual growth first, then and only then do we have a real chance. And that's what I hold on to and will leave you with tonight. That spiritual growth, then and only again, can we hold on to that hope that was offered us the day we walked in, to that freedom that is available to us every day, and that, to that desire to keep it, which we get by passing it on at every opportunity. <coughs> Excuse me. And for that, I can never be sufficiently grateful. Blessed be. Thanks.